So, thank you all for coming. I gather we've got about two hours. Um, I'm happy to take questions as we go. Um, I'll probably talk for maybe an hour and 15 minutes or something, and a uh, longer discussion, maybe we can push it to the end after that. But sure, anything short, comments, questions, uh, feel, free to, feel free to ask. And we've got a very small, minor topic here, uh, evolution, artificial intelligence, and the future of humanity. Uh, and I hope I'll, I'll be able to say some things on each of those that will uh, be uh, interesting. Um, so I'd like to start with evolution. And uh, I want to think at sort of an abstract level about uh, intentional systems, systems that have something they're trying to do in the world. And so they've got some goals they're trying to achieve. And they do that by sensing their environment, by making decisions based partly on what they sense, uh, taking some actions in the world, then seeing what happens and updating themselves in some way. That's sort of the core sort of inward algorithm, if you like, of an intentional system. And biology has produced systems that do this at all different scales. And I just put together some pretty pictures here. Um, viruses are probably the simplest things that you could consider as living. Um, they're basically just molecules, but they often sort of do interesting things. Like this little guy has a little capsule that carries its DNA. It kind of acts like a mosquito in that it goes around and finds a cell. And with, in the right conditions, it injects its DNA into the cell, which then makes copies of it. And so you can kind of see the core elements of uh, its purpose. Its purpose is to make copies of itself. And in fact, what drives much of evolution is the goal of surviving and replicating and having offspring. Um, next level up from, from viruses are bacteria. These are uh, little one-celled guys that are, are prokaryotes, which means that they have a very simple structure. They've got only an outer cell membrane with kind of a bag of, of proteins. Um, up from them are the protozoas, which are one-celled eukaryotes, which uh, means they have a lot more structure. The eukaryotes came from a synergy of prokaryotes, a bunch of what used to be separate organisms coming together. And uh, they form really amazing and quite sophisticated uh, animals. Uh, slime molds are sort of one step. For, uh, they're kind of halfway between single-celled animals and uh, multicellular animals. When times are good and there's a lot of food around, they act as individual, separate little individual cells. They cruise around, they eat their food, they kind of ignore one another. But when times start getting bad, the food starts drying up, they come together and they agglomerate into this kind of slug-like thing which can crawl around. It finds a good place and then it forms this stalk where it um, sort of lets the little spores out and uh, it gets blown in the wind and they are replicated in that way. And so they're kind of halfway. Some of, the some of their life, they're individual little creatures and some of their life, they come together as a a collective, and we'll see that the theme of uh, cooperation and separate entities coming together to form a larger entity is one of the ones that I think is really central in all of the things I'll talk about. Um, multicellular organisms, of course, are the familiar animals. Here's some beautiful, rich, amazing diversity of the forms that animals take. People, of course, uh, have been the most successful animal, and we've done that uh, in part by being much more cooperative. Um, you know, all the buildings we see around here were built out of the cooperative efforts of a, a large group of people. None of us could have built this building on our own. Um, social insects sort of have taken that cooperative nature and created societies that are even more tightly integrated than human societies. Um, just amazing, you know, things like this is the um, uh, termite mounds that can get, you know, many, many feet high, and uh, anthills and uh, beehives and uh, wasps' nests. By studying the social insects, uh, you can get some insights into how cooperation works and some of the structures. And uh, there's some recent research that uh, is really analyzing the ways that uh, beehives make decisions. They can do incredible things. Um, uh, in, in some ways, anthills have a little part of their anthill which is like the brain. And when a, a, an ant finds some new kind of food that it hasn't seen before, brings it into that little part of the anthill, and there's a little council of elders that kind of keep track of what's coming in and what's needed and they make the decisions. And uh, so you sort of start to see some of the structures, uh, even in these sort of, in some ways, simplistic animals uh, that uh, are relevant to human and uh, AI kinds of systems. And organi organizations you can think of also as a form of intentional system, ranging from political organizations, businesses, sports organizations. They have to sense their environment. They keep have knowledge. They have to make decisions, and then they take the actions. And then finally, we're starting to see more and more uh, robotic systems, which have the same uh, sorts of um, pieces in order to take, take action. Um, to kind of get, uh, understand sort of um, the levels of complexity, 
of this kind of operation. I thought it would be interesting to go in some detail into one or organism. Uh, we're in a period, a radical, amazing period in the history of biology right now, where the human genome was just sequenced a few years ago, and now they're busily going around sequencing the genomes of all the different animals. And we're ferreting out the whole evolutionary history and uh, the way the operation of, of, of these animals. The human cell, you know, we still have, there's still a lot of parts of us that we don't understand, but these, these little guys, we're getting to the point where we almost completely understand them. So E. coli, uh, very, very common, very plentiful uh, bacteria. In fact, there's billions of them in each one of our guts at this very moment. Um, they're about two microns long, and they have uh, uh, 4,377 genes, which have been complete, we now completely know what they are. These genes code for proteins, which make up the structure of these, these little guys. Um, we know what the, the, the sequence of all the proteins are. About half of them we know actually what the shape and the, the way that they function are. Um, this is the, sort of what they look like. They've got ten of these little tails, these flagella, that they spin around that helps them swim. They also have a few hundred of these little pili, which are kind of like little hairs that they use to attach themselves to the um, uh, intestinal wall, which is where they, they live and where they get the food. Um, they've got about 18,000 ribosomes. Uh, there's basically just a, um, a single membrane on the outside. They're kind of a bag uh, completely filled up with these proteins. The ribosomes are the, the machines, so the, the factories that make more, uh, more proteins. About 3 million ATP molecules is just where they get their energy. About 25 million lipids, which is what they make their uh, protein, uh, their, their um, uh, membrane out of. And about 23 billion water molecules. And a few little smatterings of other things like iron and some other minerals. And that's it. That's, that's what these things are. And yet they have amazing rich lives and amazing ways that they act in the world. There's an incredible book called Microcosm by Carl Zimmer that just came out a little while ago that summarizes sort of everything that's known about the life cycle of these things. And um, if you think about it, for being such a simple entity, uh, it has a very difficult task. It somehow has to make its way into the right part of the gut of every person in this room. How did it get there? How does it know how to do that? And Basically, they, they uh, survive in the outside world in a kind of dormant state until they finally get eaten. And once they're eaten, they um, uh, go into your stomach. And you know, our stomachs have stomach acids, which are designed to digest things like this. So it has to have a very intricate way of getting around that. And the way it does is it, it goes into what some people call a zen state, where it um, shuts down all of its normal metabolism. And it turns on these ion pumps that pump out the protons to keep the acid from uh, eating them. It sort of can sense when it's in the, in the stomach. It can um, sort of do this thing, shift its whole physiology until it gets through the stomach, and then it ends up in the small intestine. It has to go through the small intestine, which is long, long distance for, for something of this size. And it has to figure out where it is in the, uh, in the animal that it's in and find the right place and, and latch onto the wall uh, so that it gets the nutrients at the right stage. It forms uh, amazing societies of, of lots of these guys form these biofilms where they group together. Uh, they kind of combine their, their uh, flagella together. And uh, so it's really quite rich. They communicate, they get into these wars. Some of them uh, commit suicide to kind of kill uh, E. coli of, of other kinds. There are sort of lots of variants of E. coli around, some of which make us very sick, most of which are very benign, in fact, helpful and good for us. And so it's in this little package, this thing that has much of, of the richness of biological life. And um, here is the genome. Um, you can find this, there are several websites devoted to E. coli. E. coli has kind of become a model organism for biologists. And um, they've identified every single gene, and you sort of zoom in on it, and you can sort of see you know, exactly you know, which um, uh, uh, nucleic acids code for the, uh, for the gene for a particular protein, and which things enable it, and so on. And then the people studying this, the biologists studying this, have um, some of the proteins uh, glom on to the DNA, and they enhance the production of other proteins, and some of them glom on and they, they shut it down. These proteins form a big network. This is the way that the E. coli thinks, if you want to think of it as thinking. Can't see it too well, but this is the regulatory network of the, the way that E. coli uh, works. Up here, these are various things that it senses in its environment. Um, different molecules touch its uh, outer membrane, and that triggers some stuff inside. It uses that to uh, uh, code for the uh, production of, of certain proteins, which code for other ones, and it forms this sort of network. And then that causes it to take actions, to swim or to go into this weird state to communicate with its neighbors. And so in some sense, this is the diagram of the E. coli brain. 